Now, I think this illustration may go over some people's heads, so bear with me. Don't, if you haven't seen the movie, don't worry about it. I, I think it'll all make sense by the end. But after asking the question at the Joy Fellowship service and getting the unlikeliest hand to raise, saying they had seen it, I'm going to ask this anyway. Um, but before I do, as a, as a person who has always been a fan when I, of, of horror movies, and I grew up as a fan of horror movies because of the old classic ones, like The Werewolf of Lon Chaney Jr. and Bela Lugosi's Dracula. It always fascinated me how they put like that makeup on and can make those real people look like uh, hideous monsters. And that, that whole makeup special effects thing has just fascinated me my whole life. So as a fan of such movies, I've watched my share of B-rated horror films. Uh, some of them are just so awful uh, that they're unbearable and you don't even finish them. Some of them are just so awful they become laughable. They almost become comedies because they're just so funny, uh, which they're usually not intended to be funny, but they're funny anyway. Um, the best, though, the best of the B-rated horror films are those that can overcome their small budgets to make something truly shocking and memorable, regardless of whether they draw laughs or screams. Now, such a movie uh, is uh, The Evil Dead. How many of you have heard of that? There was a remake recently, but then, but, but the, the one that I'm referring to, the series I'm referring to, came out in the 80s by Sam Rainey, uh, Rainey who went on to make things like Spider-Man and other such films. But it had its scares, and it, but it was also so over the top that it had its moments of laughter as well. And actually, that was intentional in this film. And they capitalized on it even more in the sequels. Not any less than in the last sequel, which is my favorite of the films in that series, uh, called Army of Darkness. Have you heard of or seen Army, Army of Darkness? I didn't think so. But again, I was shocked by who raised their hand at the first service, so I was like, I've got to ask. Anyway, Bruce Campbell is the guy who plays the main character in this film, and his character's name is Ash, uh, which is actually appropriate for the sermon series, being that it's from Ash, right? So uh, Bruce's character, Ash, is thrust into me medieval Europe to destroy and find, uh, to, to find and destroy this evil book that is causing the dead to come to life. It's a standard horror story, right? And so in order to do that, he has to find this book and utter these words in Latin, which he messes up, and instead of destroying the evil forces, he actually resurrects them, and then there's a whole, the whole movie is based on him trying to fight this evil dead army that is trying to take over the world. I will never forget the one scene where the leader of this army calls out to his zombie troops, Sally Forth! Now, I was a teenager when I watched this, and I was like, Sally Forth? What in God's earth does that mean, right? Like, I, I know what Forth means, but what is Sally Forth? Have you ever heard that phrase, Sally Forth? Okay, if you're in the military, I'm sure you know what this is. I was not in the military as a teenage boy, um, and so I had no clue what this meant. The phrase Sally Forth actually comes from the Latin salire, which means to jump. Thus, Sally Forth means to jump forth. And this is often used to summon the troops to jump out of a besieged position into a quick attack designed to surprise the enemy. In fact, they, they call that kind of attack a lightning attack. It's supposed to be like a bolt of lightning rushing out and taking the enemy by surprise. Um, it didn't work out so well for the army of darkness, but, but that is what that phrase means. See? Who said you can't learn something from horror movies, right? <laughs> now, in our scripture today, Paul tells us a couple of things. First, at one time he relied on obedience to the law for his salvation. As a Jew, a faithful Jew, he was Jewish from birth, circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the Pharisees, who 
demand the strictest obedience to the law. And if that wasn't enough, he proved his zeal for God's law through his persistence and, and, and persecuting the members of the Christian church. Now, in his day and age, he wouldn't have seen that as persecution because, because he was trying to defend the faith. These people were perverting the faith and leading us away from the Torah, which God gave to Moses, and it needs to be stopped and stopped now. Have you ever felt so sure that something was wrong that you did everything in your power to stop it from happening? I know I have. And I would imagine, whether hands are raised or not, we all have done this. Well, that was Paul in this moment. Uh, and by the way, we in the church like to think that we're not a people of the law. But we do have a book called the Book of Discipline. Where we thumped down the law at people. And, on an even more plain level, we often pride ourselves as good Christian people, do we not? How many of us think of ourselves as good Christian people? Of course, I'm not going to get... Okay, good. we got people raising their hands. That's good. Okay. It's like I know where he's going with this. I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> but um, we do. We often pride ourselves as good Christian people. I mean, sure, we're not perfect, but we're not that bad, right? Like, we've done, you know, like, I helped that little old lady cross the parking lot to her car, and I carried her groceries with her. I donated to the Red Cross and the Salvation Army. I've done some pretty good things. <clears throat> the problem with that is, for every good thing that we've done, there's about five bad things that follow up after it, right? Like, I have never perfectly gone through life doing just all good things. Anybody here have? Okay, so if we're going to be saved based off of the good things we've done, we're hurting. <laughs> because there are probably far more bad things than good things on that list of, uh, of uh, that karmic bank, so to speak. We are not saved by how good we are. And thanks be to God for that. We are saved, my brothers and sisters, because we are loved by God. And there's nothing we can do to earn that love. Just like most parents don't uh, wait till their kids earn their love, they just start loving them from day one, amen? That's the same way with God and us. <clears throat> Paul, once prided himself in all of the good he had done. But eventually he saw those things as worthless, as garbage, as a result of his newfound faith in Christ. He was a new creation who now put his faith and trust totally and wholly in Jesus Christ. That newfound faith actually propelled him into a life of submission to Christ rather than to the law in which the Holy Spirit was working God's perfection in him. That's not to say he was perfect, but he was being perfected by God. How awesome is that? That's exactly what we had going on at the Joy Fellowship service today. A family, a mother who had never been baptized her entire life, felt the call of God, received the grace of God to answer that call, and was baptized with her three children. God knows what God's going to do in and through them for us and for the church as a whole. But God is going to do it. How awesome is that? We just baptized four people. And the same transformation that happened in Paul is going to happen and is happening in them as we speak. And hopefully this will remind us of God's work in us as well. Baptism isn't just for the baptized. It's for us who have been baptized. As a reminder that we too are new creations. No matter how much we forget that, we must remember that God has worked in us and is working within us and propelling us to be servants 
and to, shameless plug, help out at the uh, treasures of hope. <laughs> Paul's transformation in Christ led him to serve Christ and to storm the gates of hell, so to speak, to storm the gates of hell with the love of Jesus Christ. Paul's transformation led him to serve Christ and to, and to serve and to bring love to all he came across with. He went from a persecutor to a perseverer in Christ. Amen? He went from somebody who didn't believe to somebody who not only believed but caused other people to believe. He went from somebody who wanted to destroy the church to somebody who started to build the church. If it weren't for Paul, none of us would be sitting here today. And Paul was challenging his church in Philippi, and he's challenging us as well, to sally forth from the ash, from where we once were, into who Christ has made us to be, into active ministry for Christ. We are being challenged to sally forth from ash into ministry. Counteracting the army of darkness. See what I did there? <laughs> Counteracting the army of darkness with the power of God's love and grace and power and hope. As new creations, it is our charge, our sacred duty to submit to Christ and to sally forth from hiding in the ash of who we were into active service of Jesus Christ and His kingdom. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we just thank You and praise You for all that it is that You are doing in our lives. Each and every one of us, Lord, is called to follow You. And You said that following You requires some specific things. You said, first, we need to deny ourselves and our selfish ways. You second said that we need to be willing to pick up our cross, an instrument of our own death. And then we are ready to follow you. Lord, give us the strength and the courage to walk this life of faith. And to do so faithfully as witnesses of your love and your grace to all people, no matter the cost. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the grace in which you have given us and for the perfection you are working within us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and